Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring my video. If you're watching this and are thinking about making a website for your art business or your portfolio, Squarespace is the platform for you. It's got a super easy to use engine that allows you to create and upkeep a beautiful website for your business. I've been using Squarespace myself for my portfolio and as a main hub for my artwork for about a year now and I really love it. Every time I need to add some artwork, it takes seconds to do so. The built-in features like the automatic image scaling and the image editor take care of all my formatting issues if I ever have any, which I actually tend to have a lot of the time. So yeah, I think it's super important to connect uh, my social media platforms as well to the website in a way that's more integrated than just simple buttons. And so using Squarespace, I can embed my YouTube videos directly into the website so that potential clients can have a more detailed look at my process. And I've also connected my Instagram feed so that my most recent activity can be seen as well. If you want to start building your own website, you can head over to squarespace.com and get right to it for free. Once you put the website together and are ready to launch, you can go to squarespace.com slash cosmic spectrum art and get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Hello, you guys, and welcome to another video. So I am here with something different this time around. To be completely honest, I'm a little bit burnt out because I've been very, very productive lately. And usually this type of constant productivity does kind of lead me to burn out if I'm not careful. So, because I had a pretty busy uh, schedule in terms of videos for this month, I decided to take this last slot, or maybe second last slot, I don't even know yet, my schedule is a mess, um, to use some footage that I've collected over the past couple of months of me just doing some warm-ups. This is something I want to share a little bit more often with you guys. I know that I do post videos some t uh, like this sometimes, but... I think that uh, I could stand to post more of those because they are real time. It's way easier to see the real speed at which I draw, especially when I'm rusty because these are warm ups. And I think they're very, very useful things to do because this is essentially how I managed to get to the point where I am with my art. I mean, obviously there's other things involved, but I do really stand by doing studies and warm ups as a lifelong type of um, commitment. So any whomst, I, like I said, I'm going to do a Q&A session and I will keep it pretty casual. Um, since I mentioned I'm pretty burnt out, I'm just gonna read the questions, no special editing or anything like that, and um, just try my best to answer them as concisely as I can, just so I can get through as many as I can. So. The first question I'm going to do is by Angry Quoka. How long have you been drawing and what inspired you to start making art? So I want to do this one first because it's super straightforward. And just in case you guys don't know, I have been drawing my whole life. Uh, it's not something I started to pick up like later in life or um, at any particular point that I can remember. I have been drawing for as long as I can remember and I guess what inspired me to start making art is just because I was a kid and you know most kids drew from my parts so yeah that's just what it was and then I stuck to it for the rest of my life. <laughs> All right so next question is by Kalina. I really want to know, do you think education is necessary for artists nowadays? Is being self-educated enough for becoming commercial artists? Uh, what's your path with drawing like? Or I'm, I'm just going to rephrase that. Uh, what was your path with drawing like? And had, I clearly, had you clearly known what your future profession will be? Um, while I was in my last years of school. Okay, so that's like a few questions. Um, <laughs> but they're similar, so I'm just going to answer them one by one. So, um, do I think education is necessary for artists nowadays, um, or is being self-educated enough to become a commercial artist? Um, I think that the value in getting an education in an actual college scenario or like a university or whatever has, um is not entirely in actually just learning the skills or whatnot. Um, back in the day, I used to think that 
you go to these institutions to learn, which, you know, obviously you do because presumably that's what you're paying for, but if it's just learning, then no, I don't think you actually need to go um, and get like a formal education these days because there are so many resources for learning specifically that are easily available online and for a fraction of the cost that in my opinion and oftentimes are actually better than going to um, a college. But I do think that uh, going to a college or university provides a type of environment that can actually be necessary in order to keep you going, uh, in order to just keep trying to attain more skills and getting better because being surrounded physically by people who are who have the same goals as you who are like roughly in the same position in life who have you know similar skill level usually i mean you know that kind of thing varies but um it is really good to be surrounding basically surrounding yourself by like-minded people in person uh much more effective than only doing that online and especially online like you have access to so many people that are way ahead of you in the path and oftentimes you don't even necessarily know that because there is a certain portion of anonymity when it comes to uh online communities so you don't even know that like where the people that you communicate with are at in terms of their career path or like how old they are or what they're up to so i think because of that it's a really good place to be um to be surrounded by very similar people in person so i think that's the biggest value of getting an education these days but i definitely don't think that it's uh necessary to become a commercial artist by any means um and as for the rest of the question had i clearly known what my future profession would be when I was in my last grades of school, uh, no, I did not. I actually had no idea what I was going to do. I knew that I wanted to be an artist, like that I wanted to draw. And, you know, I had some idea that it would probably be characters, but I never actually thought about it very seriously. And I didn't even pick uh, a major that made any sense when I first applied for university. Like the first thing I did was apply for graphic design because I just didn't really know any better so no i had no idea what i was going to do um, in my last gra uh, grades of school uh yeah so okay hopefully that answered the question and i'm going to move on to the next one which is um by miss Ker Ker okay there's a reason why i usually don't read out the people's usernames before reading out the questions because sometimes i just don't know how to pronounce them but totally butchered that but i don't think i can do any better so i'm just gonna go on to the question if you were to start over again today what would be your first steps are there any mistakes you would have avoided in your art journey so i thought that was a very good question if i were to start over again today it's hard to like you know i can fantasize about a scenario in which i would like study more or i don't know learn an anatomy at a younger age or like do more classical training or something but i do think it's unrealistic because my for the most part like my formative years in drawing i just drew for fun only and only through observation and I think that was totally good enough for me. You know, I wouldn't do it any other way. As for any mistakes that I've made along the way, I think if I had to pick one point, I don't know, man, it's really hard. It's really hard to say, I swear to God. Like, this is the kind of thing that I don't typically dwell on. And I think mistakes are necessary. You know what? I'm just going to answer it that way. Like, it's an, it's a good question. And it's not that I don't think I have made, made any mistakes. But I don't think I would change anything regardless. Because every mistake that I have made, which has been many, many mistakes, um, have led me to a place now where I'm very satisfied with my, like, and happy with my career and with what I do. So I think in the grand scheme of things, every mistake was extremely valuable. And say, I might mention like 
you know, I accrued a lot of student debt because I arbitrarily picked a program, which was graphic design, that I had no interest- well, I'm not gonna say I had like zero interest in graphic design, but basically had no interest. It's definitely not like my favorite thing to do. It's very difficult and it's very different from being an illustrator. So that was the wrong path to choose at the beginning for sure. Um, and then I switched to illustration at the university. Um, it was like Ontario College of Art and Design University. If that, that doesn't make any sense, but that is what it's called actually. But um, yeah, I, I went to illustration, which also was not the right program for me so I have made some missteps along the way when it came to education and then I found myself in the right place when I took animation for the first couple of years and then I found that the program no longer had much to offer me personally not that I thought it was like bad or anything I just thought that I was over education in general so because of that like you know maybe i could have just quit the program two years early like would it have made a huge difference in my career if i didn't actually get a degree i don't think so because the degree has never even been brought up ever since i graduated i don't i mean it's probably good that i have it but at the end of the day i I don't think I would have lost too much if I didn't take the last two years of um, animation. But all in all, like I said, um, I managed to pay off my debt uh, and I found myself in a place where I'm super happy with my career now. And it hasn't been super long since I graduated. So even though at the time, shortly after those years, I did consider it maybe full of mistakes, but at this point, I think I still managed to arrive where I am now, so I'm in a good place, yeah. Sorry if that was like, not the best way to answer that question, but um, you know what, while we are on this question, I just wanted to really kind of stress on the fact that making mistakes is very important, and it is very important to try to assess why those mistakes were actually a good thing instead of just focusing on the fact that they presumably were the wrong thing to do. You know what I mean? Like, those two things don't have to be, like, mutually exclusive. You can make a mistake, but also it can be the best decision of your life, if you know what I'm saying. So, I don't know. Hopefully that made sense. I'm just gonna move on to the next question. Otherwise, I will never get through all the questions that I picked. So, next question by M.A. What made you pursue your art career? Example, was it your passion as a child or were you someone who didn't care for the arts until later on? Or did you maybe excel at another thing which you were going to major in, say science? <laughs> Definitely not, <laughs> but ultimately decided to switch to the arts. And so yeah, like I mentioned at the very beginning, my, my art thing is a lifelong pursuit uh, and I've always wanted to be an artist to some degree and so it definitely was not a choice uh, later in life, and I never even considered any other career paths personally. I know, like, one other thing that I could have, well, one other thing that I excelled at when I was younger was music. So I, I used to play violin. Um, my mom really wanted me to play violin, so I spent many, many years doing that when I was younger, uh, just getting, you know, like, classically trained and doing all the exams and all that other stuff. I personally hated it, um, you know, it's not that I never had fun playing it, but I just didn't see it, it wasn't a passion at all, to any degree. Um, there were a lot of things relating to music that I liked more than playing violin, so as soon as I could kind of put my foot down, I just quit, which was uh, when I was 18, I believe, and I just didn't want to go on any further with the education, even though my mom wanted me to become a violin teacher. So. Yeah, um, I had some other paths, I guess, available, but in the end, I always knew it was going to be art. So here I am. Next question by Penny Lavender. People always ask, what's the best art advice you've ever received? But what about the worst advice? What's the most unhelpful advice someone gave you? So I really like this question. It's a great question because there is so much un unhelpful and terrible advice. 
um, all around and I have gotten so much of it that I don't even know where to start. But um, I will go with the gut because the first thing that popped into my mind (laughs) when I read this question uh, took me back to when I was in high school. And at this point, I don't even remember like which teacher specifically told me this. But I was told pretty harshly that comics and anime are worthless and are not a career, like are not a viable career path. And if I wanted to take art seriously, I would have to stop quote unquote copying anime, (laughs) which I, whatever, you know what, interpret that as you will, um, and start focusing on real art. (laughs) So that was probably the worst advice I have ever gotten in my life. And honestly like i completely ignored it i did not even listen to it at all and i'm very glad about that now because it's like one of those haha moments you know like if i could go back in time and be like you were dead wrong i would do that to the teacher that said this to me and she didn't only say this to me she said it to other people as well this is just like a generally very common attitude attitude going around when I was younger, um, when I was in high school, even to some degree when I was in university, like it's only until I went to Sheridan College for animation, th- that was like the first place where quote unquote anime <laughs> wasn't looked down upon. I mean, at that point, I suppose my stylistic choices have kind of evolved to a point where they were a little bit, I don't know, removed from anime, but still anime is a big thing it was a huge influence on me uh and you know whatever i think now i'm finally at like a peaceful point in life where i can acknowledge that without having some sort of shameful or cringe-like feeling on the inside which i always had in the past like i mean at this point this is just a rant slash tangent but you know i honestly got so much negativity and criticism for liking manga i i was like a manga person all i did was read comics when i was in early high school and that was kind of like my solace in life honestly because i had kind of a shitty time um back in the day and i just kept to myself a lot and i really really found like peace and comfort from reading manga and comics and that was like a big deal for me and obviously that was half of it the other half of it was drawing and you know making my characters and like working on my little stories and whatnot so it was uh, a very important part of my life and so getting criticized incessantly about drawing manga influenced art especially at such a young age like it really did a number on my psyche because I was very stubborn, thank god, so I never took the criticism to heart enough to actually make any major changes to what I was doing, but at the same time, it's, you know, obviously, it's very unpleasant to constantly hear that kind of negative feedback, especially from people who are supposed to um, educate you or supposed to have your best interest in mind, so... Yeah, I had a lot of emotions of like shame attached to the fact that I was very influenced by manga when I was growing up and I thought that was a bad thing even though I still did it. (laughs) I didn't care, you know. It's just like a mixed bag of emotions. So I would say if somebody is like attacking your choices and just, I don't know, I think at the end of the day, you have to kind of be able to separate or at least be able to discern whether a person truly has your best interests in mind. And usually you can kind of tell, like you can tell when someone gives you feedback or advice with kindness versus when somebody just tells you something that's clearly some sort of personal belief of theirs and they're just projecting their own like outdated opinions or like super idiosyncratic opinions onto you. So yeah, that was long story short, (laughs) long story short. I think I can only do long stories. Sorry, you guys, but you're stuck with this. Anyways, um, yes, that was the worst advice I have ever gotten. So, next question is by Cupcake32009. 
when you first started your art career, commissions, open your shop, client work, did you have doubt that people would like your work and what you did? And then there's a comment about self-doubt. Okay. So, hold on, let me just read the rest of this. Okay. So, I think because I started so early, um, okay, hmm, sometimes I don't even exactly know how to pinpoint the quote-unquote start of my career. Because I started attempting to make money with my art pretty early on, like I would say in my mid-teens, like when I was 15 or 16 was the first time I tried to take commissions. Um, they were very cheap. And I just saw people do it online, like on DeviantArt, in the community, it was, it started to become a pretty common thing for bigger artists to, like more known artists to take commissions. And so I wanted to emulate the people that I look up to. So I was like, okay, I can do this too. And maybe that's actually a really, really good point. <laughs> so this question specifically kind of asked about self-doubt. So it is about self-doubt and how to like have more confidence, um, in what you're doing so thankfully for or luckily for me self-doubt was always like a mm, it was like a thing it's not that i never had any self-doubt but for the most part i would say that i was never plagued by it so i think my stubbornness always won over any self-doubt that i ever had so <laughs> when i usually I will kind of like focus on just striving so if you really want to see yourself somewhere and especially if you have people that you look up to it's good to just kind of emulate what they're doing and uh, the thing about self-doubt like you have to be honest with yourself in terms of where your art is at and if you think that your art still has room for improvement but at some point you obviously reach a point where you think it's at a point where it's good enough to sell because like to put up for sale or make products or whatever and that point is wherever you decide it to be right so you really have to kind of make your own self-assessment right because skill isn't the be all like end all of making an art career and by skill i mean like technical just clear cut technical proficiency like there there are so many different uh aspects to making a product that's appealing than just straight up skill sometimes if uh the niche is super specific and there are certain styles that are a lot um <laughs> i mean i don't want to like sound condescending by saying easier but it is a fact that certain type of types of artwork are just easier to learn certain styles are easier to learn and produce than others so because of that there is no specific um like style uh, minimum requirement I, I suppose that would bar you from you know trying to do your own business and i don't know am i growing off point okay i was talking about self-doubt so I think if you're doubting yourself, you really have to ask yourself why. If it's just a fear of not selling or like or failing that's holding you back, don't let it because you basically you can't you will never know until you try, first of all. And the last thing you want to do is to avoid doing anything at all just because you're too scared to see what's gonna happen. So that's, if that's the kind of doubt, then you might as well just start. And if nothing happens, then you just have to figure out what changes to make in order to get a different result. So I started trying to sell my art when I was pretty young. And because it was such a long time ago, like I, I didn't get that much interest at first. You know, there was some, shockingly, I, I might add, <laughs> there was a little bit of interest. Like, I got a couple of commissions the first time I opened. Um, I was in kind of a good position, I suppose. Like, I had, you know, just a little bit of a following on DeviantArt and a couple of people um, did commission me. And it was like a really, it was a very micro level. Like, this is by no means any type of money that you can even close to remotely make a living off of but still even just a tiny bit of interest at the very start helps a lot and 
I will say that a following to some degree, at least a little bit, um, is what you do need to get started. Because if you have no audience whatsoever, then, you know, it wouldn't be like a surprise if you don't get any sales. And you shouldn't take that too personally because, you know, if nobody ever sees your product, of course, nobody's going to buy it. So, yeah, I will say that these days that um, the whole follower thing and like gaining a following is... A pretty tough barrier but to specifically kind of talk about that for a little bit I think you have to persevere and do what you love because I totally believe that if you really love what you're doing and you you really like your own art there will definitely be people who like it as well and you have to just focus on your own relationship with it and I guess share it as well but if you keep your own relationship with your artwork healthy, I think that is conducive to um, building, I don't know, some sort of resonating uh, body of work with other people. I will say that maybe that's like, I think it's possible that this opinion that I hold is because I just don't have any other experience, but I have had to jump ship many times on social media and start more or less from scratch um, on a couple of platforms. But I've never, like, I think I'm really lucky in a sense that I've never had to um, struggle super hard in order to gain a following. But at the same time, one thing that I know for sure is that my relationship with my own artwork and how I feel about it has always been very clear to me and I've always liked my own art like I still do that doesn't mean I don't think there's no room for improvement it's just that I've always really liked the stuff that I do and continue to because of whatever reason so I have like a very healthy relationship with my own art and um, sometimes I have products that don't sell you know very well but i don't take it personally so yes like i think before i spend the rest of this video like circling around the subject of self-doubt i'm just gonna move on but yeah i don't know i think you you should definitely continue to try and push through and i think you will find success if you just you know continue doing what you love and putting it out there um obviously there's a lot more to say there but unfortunately i'm just gonna have to move on to the next question so this question is by Kim. Um, I've known that you have been planning uh, slash plan on working on your personal project for the longest time. And I always wondered if there was something initially that made you want to start doing a comic or if there was anything that inspired you to dedicate so many years to make it happen. Uh, and there's also a little snippet that says, anyways, your art never fails to motivate me. So thank you for everything. Uh, thank you for including that. And thank you to everybody also who left nice little comments like that. It means a lot to me. It's really nice to read. But back to the question. Okay, so I do like this question because there's actually a very specific reason as to why I want to um, do a comic. So a comic to me is seems like the most accessible and the top tier, like the, the absolute top level of possible execution for the type of story that i want to do so let me just explain that of course if i had a lofty goal like if i were to say you know there's no restrictions there's no time limitations or anything like that um no budget limitations ideally yeah i would love to do like an animated series or something like that like top quality animated series yeah but something that looked like arcane that would be perfect that is what i would love but Obviously, that's impossible for me alone. And um, I think maybe if I was more ambitious, I would consider like planning something, like looking for funding. I don't know, like going some sort of weird pitching route where I could maybe secure funding to do an animated show. But I think all of that is so crazy and complicated that um, from what I can understand, the absolute top of my capability as a one man army <laughs> is a comic. Um, because I do want to draw the images and I really like actions and I want to draw as much of it as possible. Um, a comic to me appeals more than just writing like a story 
and including some illustrations which is also i think an option but i think my strength lies in being able to draw stuff rather than trying to describe it <laughs> or you know what i mean like i don't know i've never really tried to write actual prose like in a novel format but something tells me i'm not gonna be good at that so yeah that that's why i want to do comics um i don't even really read comics at all anymore and i haven't for a very long time but i i it's still to this day um, remains one of my favorite um i guess mediums to look at or at least mediums that has so much potential so that is why i want to do a comic and i have been wanting to do it since i was about 12 or something since the very first time i started reading manga it was like my biggest inspiration so yeah quickly moving on to the next question this one is by elisa dinsmore would you ever consider giving landscapes or oceanscapes a go i would imagine your new with your new comic that you have to delve more into backgrounds and i'm curious about what type of backgrounds you will be using for your comic um yeah actually hmm landscapes i've definitely done before uh for various purposes especially in the graphic novel uh grimoire noir that i have illustrated uh, several years ago ocean stuff i've never done you know you know what guys random fact about me oceans really kind of scare me i've never <laughs> I've never been one of those water people. Water always has some sort of deeply unsettling vibe. I know that it's like one side of the coin, right? But I actually... You know what? This is like a completely different topic. Maybe I should just do a different video about this. But um, water is like not a good thing in my dreams. But you know what? I'm not gonna... <laughs> I'm not gonna get into that. I I sometimes I feel like I get bad omens in my dreams, and they all have something to do with water. But again, maybe I'll talk about that some other time. Anyways, yeah, I've never really done any like underwater. I've never done any mermaid participation at all, which is kind of curious because, you know, I could find things that I like about it. The darker side of the whole mermaid thing, I can see being into that, but. Yeah, I just never drew any mermaids, ever, even though it's such a big challenge. I don't know, I don't know, it just kind of eluded me. But maybe sometime in the future, um, as for the backgrounds that I will be using for my comic, um, the setting is actually pretty standard as far as, like, most st I don't know, you know how most stories that are of this nature have like some sort of small town and then like a secluded boarding school that that's exactly what my story is so those are the settings and there's some landscapes there's some foresty areas of course and the small town thing and yeah i don't know it's pretty straightforward um i will probably try to do some sort of uh, 3d modeling situation in order to help me with the continuity for stuff um related to my comic but yes Okay, moving on to the next question. This one is by Hummus. Hummus. <laughs> okay, uh, what is the biggest thing you did that helped you improve on your art journey? How did you find your style and are you happy with where you are? If not, what are some things you would work on? Okay, so what what is the biggest thing that I did that helped me improve my art journey? Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is I did a ton of guesswork when it comes to anatomy uh for a very long time like basically up until i went to sheridan college and that was like pretty late i was i must have been like 21 or something when i went there so up until then i pretty much just kind of winged it yeah now that i think about it legit i knew nothing about anatomy it was all just guesswork just kind of like oh this looks kind of right so i'm just gonna roll with it type of situation so yeah i that brings me to say that the best thing that helped me improve the most on my art journey was actually learning anatomy and it was pretty great because uh it made me realize that you know what 
my guesswork was not bad at all. In fact, a lot of it was actually pretty bang on just based on observation. But that's what's kind of so cool about art. Like, you don't necessarily need to know what every bone and muscle is called. But when you find out, it like really gives you power. So it was super thrilling to actually gain knowledge and have that second layer of um, self-assured um, action when it came to drawing because you know what like I've never really suffered from um, lack of confidence in my line work or lack of confidence in anything really when it came to like execution for whatever reason I know because I was always just like yeah this looks all right and I'm just gonna roll with it so I've always had confident lines and maybe that was like part of the reason why I could just visually kind of sell it um, just because it looked like I looked like I was completely um, sure that I knew what I was doing. But anyways, yeah, after I actually learned about anatomy and learned uh, what the structure really was underneath, um, it really helped a lot. And it super like elevated my art and pretty quickly too, uh, very quickly. But obviously, uh, um, alongside learning the anatomy and um, all the bone names and the mus muscular structure and whatnot, I did a lot, a lot of life drawing as well, and obviously that, I think, has to go hand in hand. So life drawing is the short answer, is what helped me the most in my art journey. And how did I find my style? The style thing is like, you know, it's a super popular question. I don't want to get into it because there's a ton of good videos on it, and I think I actually did a video on it too back in the day. Uh, maybe I'll do an update, but a style just happens over time. And I am generally pretty happy with where I am now. But it's kind of a tricky thing. Because one thing that I do want to mention is something that I sometimes bring up in my other videos. But like doing a lot of client work that's very spe stylistically specific um, can actually have a pretty big impact on style or whatever like my own personal style because having to switch back and forth can be challenging and challenges are fun but doing too much client work kind of starts warping my style to the point where it becomes difficult to go back to what i actually want to achieve and yeah that's like something that i've been struggling over the past couple of years because sometimes you know i'll have like a period of time in which i do a lot of client work over a few months and then suddenly I find myself like being totally unable to do proportions the way that I want, that I, the way that I um, initially wanted to do them, especially in the face. Like the size of the eyes is brutal. Like I will do a bunch of, I guess I can talk about it now, but I've done a lot of um, doll packaging illustration type of work uh, the past couple of years, along with like character design for... Um, that, that actually had a lot of very similar subject matter and in fact my a lot of the work that I did for character design for a different company and different project was still very similar in terms of proportions and like those types of projects require a certain style um, that everybody likes it's like a very commonly appealing style the eyes are very big and after doing that for a while my god like I just can't like shrink them it's, it becomes very difficult to draw eyes at a regular size that i typically prefer to on my characters faces so yeah actually currently struggling with that so hopefully i'll be able to pull back and get back to normal um did i miss anything in this question where was i okay and the last part of the question is if not what are some things you would work on oh actually i guess i kind of talked about that so yeah, working on um, trying to retain the style that I like and not getting lost in the weeds. So, yes, moving on to the next question. This one is by Iron Wings. You said you play League of Legends before. What's your preferred role and who's your main? Uh, <laughs> I like this question because it's random. It's got nothing to do with art. So, yeah, I had a mild League of Legends addiction. Um actually sometimes it was kind of severe but uh thankfully i was able to pull away and uninstall and it has since n not bothered me but every time i think about it i want to play so it's a bit of a problem anyways my preferred role was uh adc and actually my main was caitlin i think for the most part 
Though I did like, uh, I don't know, like Zaya for a while. I kind of bounced back and forth between a few. Oh, I really like Morgana too, even though she has nothing to do with ADC, but that's the one support role that I will play. But anyways, without diving too far into that, and it's just want to play now, but <laughs> yeah, I like, uh, I like Caitlyn. She's my favorite. Ah, good times, good times. Okay, next question. By Inksme148. Hello, as a trad traditional artist, what do you personally do to avoid hand, wrist, arm, eye, back, neck strains while drawing for long amounts of time? Also, is there going to be a studio tour? So quick question, a uh, quick answer to the studio tour thing. Uh, not really because I don't really have a studio. I just have a desk with a little bit of the surrounding area, but unfortunately there is nothing to show. Sorry. Um, as for the uh, hand, wrist, arm, eye, back, neck, drains, avoidance, um, okay, so I'll give you a quick, I'll give you guys a quick rundown to the health problems that I've experienced in relation to art. It's not that bad. I've been sort of lucky, I will say, but, um, thankfully I've never had wrist, hand or wrist stuff. Well, hand, okay, so I do get a cramp on my knuckle. Wait, no, not not my knuckle. My like my middle finger because I rest um I rest the pen directly on like the last joint on my middle finger and I kind of really press down hard on it. Sometimes I have the death grip going on. So, I used to have pain developing there, like just sore and like it would just ache if I draw for longer than it was usually like I had to draw like four or five hours in a row, like straight with, without taking any breaks is what would cause it. So these days I don't really draw for that long per day. Like I think five hours, but with breaks in between is probably the most time that I spend drawing in one day, um, which is I think a good thing because, you know, like when I was working really hard on Grimoire Noir, sometimes I would uh, exceed that by like but I can't even exceed it that much like I can probably go for like six and a half hours tops but if I go for like seven or even approach eight hours of straight drawing in one day I will have so much aching in that joint in my hand the next day that it's just gonna prevent me from working at a regular schedule so um, I might as well just not even bother trying to work for longer than like five or six hours like specifically drawing Anyways, so yeah, that would be my advice for preventing an injury on the hand or the wrist to just like really know what your limitations are and to just make sure you don't exceed them no matter how into it you are, like it's not worth it. And as far as other problems, like I have like perpetual neck strain. I think the best way to combat that is to just do some exercises and preferably do a lot of neck exercise like neck stretches and back exercises um that's the best way to go about it you just got to work out like otherwise <laughs> there's no like because things get so inverted when you constantly hunch over a desk so you do kind of have to put extra effort into strengthening your back because it's otherwise it's it's going to be bad so i still have some upper back um aching neck strain stuff like that it's really hard to combat but it has gotten a lot better since i started trying to kind of um take better care of my body in terms of um doing exercises and stuff as for eyes okay so eyes is a pretty big thing for me like i've have had some issues with my eyes uh, my eyesight is pretty bad um it's currently negative five hopefully it doesn't get any worse than that but I mean, it was, like, pretty bad when it started. Like, when I remember getting glasses when I was, like, 12 or something, I'm pretty sure it was already minus 3. So, you know, down to minus 5 at this point, maybe it's not so bad. But I digress. So, the problems that I've had with my eyes is actually a really long story. Maybe that would... Maybe I will actually make a separate video talking about it because those problems were pretty um, extensive. And I had to do a lot to figure out how to solve them. But now it's better. And I think it's important to like make sure your eyes don't get too dry. So like if you use contact lenses, make sure you lubricate your eyes. Like get some eye drops and use those 
um, frequently if you can. I don't know. But uh, take breaks. Like, let your eyes have some rest. That's the best thing I can say for now. And I will save the rest of the story for another video. Um, as for um, arms, well, I guess that's, that's, that's pretty much it. So hand, wrist, arm, that's kind of like the same thing. Back, back and neck. That's, that's the problem that I have at the moment. Um, and like my lower back, like the very lower back sometimes hurts. And again, just taking breaks, like not sitting for too long. Uh, not sitting in weird ways would probably help. I sit in a weird way. Like I always cross my legs and always to one side. So that's that causes some problems um i would avoid doing that if you can so <laughs> that's the best advice i can give about that at the moment um okay so next question is by how about no <laughs> it's funny uh when it comes to your stylized semi-realistic anatomy do you make your most common choices because of aesthetic preferences or ease with certain shapes um i Okay, so the rest of this question is a little bit of both or and then there's a comment that says for me it tends to just be a difficulty in breaking mindless habits so i wonder if that's a i wondered if that's a struggle for an artist i admire as well so yeah you know what sometimes breaking mindless habits is a little bit difficult and actually even though i typically don't fall into that trap when it comes to anatomy or drawing characters i fall into it when it comes to drawing backgrounds and like foliage so for me foliage is the biggest thing leaves like things like leaves my god i just have some sort of weird way that my hand will just quickly try to do leaves in this really predictable pattern like so i have to work pretty hard to break that um it's just like some sort of weird um default squiggly line that my hand starts doing every time i draw leaves or like the outline of a tree or something so i have to consciously work on avoiding that but for anatomy it is so engaging to figure out the shapes that it's definitely aesthetic preference and it's like every every line is a is something like a little puzzle like every shape is a little puzzle to solve and how they all click together is also a little puzzle so it's like it's a lot of fun so i definitely don't go in autopilot when it comes to that for the most part um obviously if i'm super tired maybe i would um and there are some shorthand like lines quick lines that i make sometimes that can maybe devolve into uh mindless habits but at the end of the day um, even if I do a first pass mindlessly, I will always go back and like refine it with a lot more thought, thoughtful input. So hopefully that answers the question. And I am about halfway <laughs> through the questions and there's like 10, 15 minutes left in footage. Okay. I, I think I'll, I can probably do like a couple more. Let's see. Okay, so next question. I'm just going to stop reading out the names because I know I'm going to butcher them. Because there's a couple that I, I don't know how to pronounce. So I'm just going to ask the question and answer it. Okay, so question. I was wondering what type of art approach are you thinking for your comic? Would you choose a traditional style or make it digital? Um, that is a good question because it has been a little bit of a conundrum for me for the last couple of months trying to figure that one out. I know that realistically, for the most part, I will have to do it digitally, but the question that I'm currently stuck on is whether I should do certain parts of it traditionally. And that's something I'm still kind of struggling with. So yeah, that remains to be seen. I think it would be really cool to do at least some portion of it traditionally. And of course, like any sort of supplemental illustrations that I might do for fun just to like add like a, as a chapter beginner beginning illustration or something like that i will i can definitely do traditionally but as for the actual comic like it does present some complications and a lot of extra work like scanning and cleaning up and whatnot so yeah i'll have to think about that but i am considering doing the prologue uh traditionally but yeah um thank you for taking interest i will definitely talk about this again soon hopefully <laughs> Okay, so next question. Mm. Do I have any advice for recording my art? 
process setup. Yes, I do, actually. Um, I'm not, like, an expert or by any means on this. Uh, in fact, I think sometimes I'm not the best at recording stuff. But I do have a setup here that kind of works for me. So essentially, all you really need is like some sort of contraption that clamps onto your desk that you can easily maneuver. So <laughs> the first thing that I had was um, like a bendy, hard, wiry type of situation thing. Um, God, I keep using... I don't know what it's called. It, it was a clamp. So it clamped onto the desk and it sort of worked for the most part. But it was just a little bit too shaky because it was essentially like this bendable, long, like... I don't even know what to call it, honestly. What is the word I'm looking for? I think my brain function is starting to diminish significantly because it's been a while. But anyways, so the first clamp thing that I had was just like a bendy wire, long bendy thick wire thing um, with a clamp at the end um, on one end to attach to the desk and with the phone holder thing um, attachment on the other end. And obviously I use my phone and I still actually use my phone to record all my videos. Um, I'm planning to try using a camera, like a professional camera soon, but at the moment I only use my phone. And since then I've gotten a more sturdy contraption that clamps and um, you can like kind of bolt it tight to the, you, you can clamp it to the desk that it doesn't move so easily. Yeah, I don't know any of the terminology for these parts, so I'm sorry. I sound like an idiot right now, but I literally don't know what any of this stuff is called. So I will say that it's really easy to find. All you have to do is um, uh, search some basic keywords in Amazon, and I'm sure you'll be able to find the thing that I use. So that's really all you need. And obviously you need some good lighting, but I personally have terrible lighting on my desk so I try to just like wait to draw a certain times of the day but if, if I can't do that I'll just use a desk lamp which is why sometimes the lighting is terrible in my videos and I do apologize for that <sighs> okay so next question mm -mm -mm -mm. yeah I have a couple of these left and maybe I can actually get through them uh let's do this one are there any subjects you find difficult to draw i love drawing organic shapes like animals humans nature but i struggle with any symmetrical or architectural shapes like houses cars etc also i don't recall seeing you draw any animals would you try to in a future video okay so the most difficult thing to draw for me hmm I don't know, a lot of things are hard to draw. I would say, like you, I have the most difficulty with architectural shapes. Like symmetrical things, architectural shapes like houses, cars. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for those things, like, I really need to know what I'm drawing. and <laughs> That requires, like really looking for references and studying the object and trying to understand like the more i understand about how something is structured the better like the easier it is to draw it but for some things like it's just beyond me like i don't care about cars my god like i don't know anything about cars and i kind of can't really get into it so i need to just look up references and use my best judgment oh that actually really reminds me um you know what the most difficult thing for me is to place a character in a scene and make them the right size next to an object. So it's something that, you know, I never really think about. And this is probably common, I would assume, if you don't draw a lot of backgrounds or characters interacting with props and stuff. But man, like, it's way harder to figure out how big a person is in comparison to an object just like that. Like... How big is a person next to a horse? Like, unless you have a ton of experience with, with horses, it's actually kind of difficult to guess super well um, what the size difference would be. Um, same with, like, a chair. Like, how high does a chair come up to a person? Like, maybe it's just me, but, you know, it is kind of difficult to just know all these things. So, it t I think it takes a lot of drawing from life and specifically taking note of... A person within a setting so 
is a huge difficulty for me specifically because that's something I haven't done a whole lot of. Usually when I do, when I did like figure drawing and every time I do studies, it's always just a person maybe interacting with something super simple, but for the most part, I'm just focusing on the body and the anatomy and like the clothing. And I never really draw the background elements, so it's hard to place a person into a background and make them be the right size. That's difficult as hell for me. Yeah. Oh, and um, another part of this question was about animals. I don't know. I'm not like a huge fan of drawing animals because I don't think I'm very good at it. I do love animals. I love looking at them and interacting with them to some degree. Although I'm not a dog person. Dogs kind of freak me out, but that's also a story for another day. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Maybe sometime in the future I should draw animals just to like explore something outside of my comfort zone, but not really planning on it at the moment. Although I have been thinking about drawing my cat. I think I would really like to draw my cat. Yeah. Okay, so next question. How do you deal with not being too nitpicky about the small stuff or things you feel you could have done better in your work? I'm just gonna assume the question is like, how do I deal with not being 100% happy with my work or something like that? So I do have a method for dealing with this. And that method is settling for something that is good enough and not aiming for absolute perfection. And it's kind of a lifesaver, honestly, because God, if I was obsessed with making a drawing exactly how I wanted it to be or getting every point of it to some sort of current perfection standard, I would never be able to finish a drawing. So I would say my best advice for dealing with like not being too nitpicky is to just kind of like pick a level at which you will declare something good enough. You know, like it <laughs> good enough is fine. It doesn't have to be great. And you know what? Everything I draw is me just settling for good enough for the most part. I don't know if that's like a good thing. Um, I don't know if maybe I should try a little harder, but I just don't have the patience. Like, I can't, I'm not like one of those people who can work on a painting for days and days and weeks. For me, if a drawing has bled over into a third day, it's taking too long, okay? Like, that's the kind of person that I am. Usually, one or two days tops, and I'm done, and I'm on to the next one. It's not that I've never drawn anything that took longer than that. But it's so tedious when it takes longer, and I really prefer to just kind of settle for some sort of, you know, good enough, happy medium, and then just move on. Yeah. I don't know if that helped at all, but that's the best answer I can give to that. Okay, so I think I'll just do one more question. Um, the last question will be, what are some, what are some solutions you have to setting up tables for conventions? How do you strike the balance between being eye-catching but efficient in space and storage? Oh my god, so this question is... Ugh. I am notoriously terrible at convention setups. It's been haunting me my whole life. Like, every time I do a convention, literally, the very last convention that I did was the best setup I've ever had by a mile. And it was like, super simple. But it was the first time I have not failed to set up. The very first time after years of doing conventions. So I'm probably not the best person to ask. But I think simplicity is good. Although there are so many different approaches that you can take. It really kind of depends on what kind of stuff you're selling. So you really should probably lean into your niche. So if you fall under some sort of niche, you really got to like grasp the... Um, the aesthetic that matches by its throat and really roll with it because I think tables that really kind of um, lean into the aesthetic of the stuff that they're selling do so well like because their tables tend to be so eye-catching and it's perfect like the more detail you put into how well the aesthetic choices of the extra objects that you use to display your artwork and your products uh, if that feeds in well to the kind of artwork that you're doing it will bode well for sure 
For me personally, um, obviously I have like a vintage aesthetic um, for the most part, but I cannot cobble enough stuff together to actually sell it properly. I have fantasies about what kind of perfect um, setup I might have with like all sorts of vintage knickknacks that I use as like little props to you know put my products on or whatever and some sort of antique beautiful frames to uh, display my artwork in but you know like that takes so much effort and so much coordination not to mention like you have to figure out how to transport it and so yeah it's it's just too much for me personally although I do love it when people do that and those are the tables I tend to buy stuff at and I think they do super well but yeah for practical advice definitely need some sort of tablecloth that's better than the stuff that they provide you at conventions usually the stuff that they have like is not great um so i would um highly recommend having your own tablecloth uh, that sort of matches your art in a way like color wise i guess at least or just go for a simple black or white and i personally really like the crates to use the, the crate setup so I used to use these really ugly grid-like ones that are metal. They were super heavy, but now there are these other box crates that you can find on Amazon that have like a plastic sort of um, middle. Um, even though the frame is still metal, the pl the the main part of the crate, again, I'm, I'm running into a lack of vocabulary here. I don't know what these things are called, but it's plastic. It's a lot easier to work with. Um, it's pretty thin, easy to stick on, and way way um lighter which is excellent because having to lug around super heavy stuff is like a huge problem so those crates you can essentially organize in any way you want and even if you just look at like some pictures i've posted from the recent convention um yeah i kind of tend to assess what the how big the table is and then decide on the crate layout according to that and it works well because i can usually fit like one print on the crate with eight and a half by 11 prints so for me it's the best solution and of course i would totally advise having a big eye-catching um banner which a lot of artists have and that's about it i think that's the best advice that i can give because otherwise i'm not very good at the cold convention thing but yeah i'm starting to talk really quickly because i'm running out of footage so i have to cut this video short but thank you guys for listening to this video if you're still here and hopefully you enjoyed this Q&A session. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I really like answering questions. I hope I was able to help with some of them. And hopefully I'll do something like this more often from now on. Because I've forgotten how much I like actually doing the Q&A sessions. So yeah, thank you so much for watching this video. And I will see you in my next one. Bye!